Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone to uh, another episode of Dialogue Gospel Study with all of us. We've got a really excellent lineup today. Um, I'm excited to see what we're able to, to wrangle with with presenters that we have. We're going to start off with an opening prayer by Natalie Taylor. Natalie is a content marketer, former professional dancer, aspiring CEO of a pizza oven business, and mom of two young boys who is based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, near her parents and siblings. Our dear Heavenly Parents, we are grateful to be gathered today and that we have the technology and tools to do so. We're grateful for all those who have prepared um, for this discussion and for those who are willing to share their hearts and their experiences. And we pray that we can feel open to thy spirit and thy love and um, draw closer to thee and um, develop a greater understanding for how we can improve our relationships with each other and um, make the world a, a better place. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. So we're going to jump right into our presentation today because we've got a lot to, of ground to cover and a lot of um, wonderful people to cover it. So our presenters today are John Gustav Rathal. John is a former executive director of Affirmation, LGBTQ Mormons, Family and Friends, and co-founder of Emmaus LGBTQ Ministry. Currently, he works full-time at a major IP law firm in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where he lives with his husband and two cats. John has been, an act, has been active in his ward of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints since 2005. Our next presenter is Dave Carl Sandberg. Dave lives in Minneapolis, Minnesota, near his three children and four grandchildren. He was raised by parents who wrestled with difficult questions and introduced him early to, on to the words and images found in dialogue which strengthened and sustained him. David graduated from BYU with a degree in economics and a minor in philosophy, and then studied and trained to be an actuary. He currently works as an expert witness on matters related to risk and life insurance, and has been blessed and challenged by a lifetime of service in church and his profession. And then finally, we have Laurel Armstrong. Laurel is a performing artist who lives with her husband, two children, <clears throat> a hawthorn tree, territorial robins, and too many yard rabbits in a suburb of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Sounds like a charming life, Laurel. I need to come visit you. Um, in another timeline, she would have had some impressive accomplishments to report in her bio. But in this timeline, she was gifted chronic illness most of her adult life. So she does what she can as she can. Currently, that includes songwriting and working as a performer in community integrated programs. Her other interests include history, myth, cultural anthropology, human behavior and sexuality, animism, music, and DIY bath and body products. <clears throat> so as always, we're excited to hear from each of these presenters. Um, they will be presenting their own views. Their views do not represent the views of the Dialogue Board Foundation or the Church of Latter-day Saints, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So please take it away. Well, thank you very much. I should probably also add that my family will also disown that I don't speak for any of them either. They are perfectly capable of speaking for themselves. Um, 2020 led to a weekly uh, set of friends and family Sunday school discussions on the Book of Mormon, thanks to Zoom and innovation. The key approaches that we used were to, one, let the text speak for itself instead of being used to confirm or affirm what we already knew, and to kind of lean into and be curious about what might seem odd or unexpected um, as opposed to being ignored. We also read honestly and empathetically, like I hope God would read us. I'll start with a couple examples of empathetic reading. One is, I think, the image of God and Satan that starts off in the book of Job. Interestingly enough, throughout Job, when God speaks, others respond. And uniquely, when Job speaks, God finally responds, welcoming him into the world that God lives in. Interestingly enough, though, when God turns Job over to Satan, he says, all right, he is in your power, only preserve his life. I found it interesting that in this context, Satan is offered an opportunity to be a protector. We often think of Satan as a destroyer. But 
God in this context is perhaps offering an olive branch saying, can you appreciate what it means to preserve and sustain life even when it is difficult? Another empathetic view we can take to Job's wife. I've in, been in New Orleans this week for meetings and I got my shoes shined the other day. I asked the person, tell me, what do you know about Job? He immediately went to his wife who says, are you still holding firmly to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he replied, you're talking like one of the godless women would do. Should we receive what is good for God and not also receive what is evil? That's often viewed as a rebuke and unfortunately reinforces too many unfortunate stereotypes. But some commentators have pointed out that Job evidently recognized that her words are the result of her personal loss and pain, as well as the desire to see her husband's suffering ended. I mentioned to the person shining my shoes, who would not want to see their spouse in such agony and pain that he is daily having to scrape the pus from his wounds um, and is clearly just suffering so intently. She's offering him the opportunity to just let go, as many of us who have seen friends or relatives suffer wish that their pain could be ended soon. It's interesting when God gives instructions for the restoration of Job's friends because of their foolish words, no mention is made of any need for Job's wife to be restored. We often ignore and don't appreciate the additional pain that we have when it is even not our own suffering, but the sufferings of those whom we care about. So with that little kind of background as to what I mean by empathetic viewing, um, you can go to the next slide. Um, as, as I prepared, of course, uh, the words that jumped out at me first was when God speaks to Job out of the whirlwind. He says, who is this that dares darken counsel with words without knowledge? Get ready for a difficult task, like a man, gird up your loins, prepare to wrestle. Um, and this has been a, uh, a great wrestling. So across that journey, um, I've listed just a few questions, none of them inconsequential. I hope that we can point to some of them. And I'm sure that those of you listening may have your own to introduce here. As we come to the question of wisdom literature, what are the things that are difficult to understand? What is it that overwhelms us? What is it that we seek more of? So for today on the next slide, I've kind of focused on my main reactions. Uh, John and Laurel will each speak to some of their main reactions to both Psalms and Job. Uh, the first, what is the nature of God's personality? How does it feel to be in God's presence? And what changes us after an encounter with the divine? Another theme, what is rejection and loss and restoration? Interestingly enough, God restores Job, Job's blessings. We seem to get a happy ending, but in the psalmist, the psalmist only seems to hope for it. There is no conclusion to the matter. Lastly, what is intimacy versus wisdom? How are they similar? How are they different? Uh, back in a class when I first met my wife, Cindy, uh, Jim Faulkner mentioned the phrase in the Old Testament, and it says that Adam knew Eve. He said in the biblical sense, to know someone is to unfold them, a knowledge of them a day at a time in an intimate manner. We see them in their highs and their lows, in their questioning and in their success but it is always a new unfolding. It's an openness to discover a partner, a person, a God, a day at a time. So I'll proceed somewhat, I guess, in a chiasmic order, focusing first on wisdom, then restoration, and then the nature of God. Psalms gives us subtle hints of wisdom. Proverbs is much more explicit uh, in describing the personality of wisdom. But I just listed a few uh, verses here that uh, are referenced in Psalm. Uh, again, alluding to Proverbs, to him that by wisdom made the heavens. 
My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. Again, this idea that this is something that emerges in quiet contemplation. Another aspect, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. So on the next slide, I've just titled The Meditative Tension of Psalms. I think it's the beginning of wisdom. About a dozen years ago, I was at some meetings in Louisville, Kentucky all day on a Sunday. And so a friend of mine and I were able to catch a Catholic service at 6 p.m. In the uh, sermon that was shared, they pointed out this uh, clarity of two contradictions, the pit of despair and the serenity of grace. And in it, the psalmist never resorts to cynicism nor denies the reality of evil, evil that may have occurred due to the actions of others or may have occurred to the choices that one's made. And then this theme that kind of weaves through it is that I, the psalmist, will wait while these two powerful opposites are reconciled. It strikes me in reading psalms that we're missing the music. Music is often far more powerful than words. And as I thought about salvation and the tension that we sometimes feel in salvation, I likened it to chords or music. Harmonizing is not where we all sing the same notes together. Harmonizing is learning not to let go of ourselves while adding to a diverse whole. And that the invitation of salvation is learning to build that music together. My dad once shared some research that he had come across in Puritan, in um, Calvinist times. When you went to church, there was a certain section that was reserved called the anxious bench. The anxious bench was for those who attending church, but had not received the internal confirmation and, and um, checklist that they had been saved. So every week they would go and sit on the anxious bench Sometimes within a few weeks, months, or maybe years or decades, they would one day arise and exclaim, I can now move to a different part of the congregation. Well, the psalmist is one who seems to be sitting a long time in the anxious bench while maintaining the honesty of both the serenity of grace and the pit of despair. So one of the things that occurred to me is just thinking about how we call, are called by God God calls us in a voice and manner that we can each understand that's unique to us because we appreciate that it's spoken in our language. I have compiled a short list over the years of friends of mine who have talked about the tipping points in their relationship with God. For an actual colleague of mine, it was in high school when she discovered calculus. Calculus was the sign that God was there and was calling to her. <laughs> For another person, it was coming across a solitary flower in the midst of a field. The imagery in Psalms, of course, as, as many have, have known, is the shepherd calls and the sheep know the voice and they come. There's a tradition in Scandinavia called kulning, which is how um, people overseeing flocks call to their animals and they know to come. Michael, if you wanna play that little clip, right now, that would be great. Thanks, Michael. So let's transition a bit and talk a little bit about Job. Who was Job? He's described as a man who was blameless in the idea of being complete and perfect and upright, meaning how he related to others. I know there's, I've heard many people over the last uh, several years talk about perfection and how they've come to appreciate perfection has to be 
trend in their mind has had to transition from being seen as a checklist of someone who never does something wrong, but as someone who is in balance, who is in harmony, who learns how to align themselves with the reality of what is going on with them. Now, Job in Arabic, uh, it's not sure if uh, the uh, the lineage of Job, it is unique in the Bi in the Old Testament. There is no reference to a promised land. There is no reference to the law or the prophets or the patriarchs. So some have assumed the story is likely set in the time of the patriarchs. But Job in Arabic may mean the one who always returns to God. And he's described as there's no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. And certainly in the story, we see at the beginning, he's noted for turning to God in his abundance. But then the rest of the story is about him continuing to turn to God in his despair. So one of the approaches I will take is looking at the characters that are named characters, the important characters, and then kind of comparing and contrasting what they might teach us about wisdom and about intimacy and about God. So certainly, I think many identify Job is a story about the challenge of intimate friendship. Job is lauded by God for being deeply honest, but it is clear his friends fear and are discomfited by his honesty. So we can bring ourselves into the question and say, when are we like Job's friends? When we are discomfited by race, behavior, the appearance of others, issues of gender, politics, economic status, geography, marital status, age. We all find ourselves when we were like, I don't want to be around that person. We also find ourselves when we don't want to be around ourselves. <laughs> we may feel shunned ourselves or separated or may feel that by our own actions, we have done it. So this is clearly the issue of, uh, that I think is nicely um, implied in Psalms, David feels shunned and separated sometimes by the evil actions of others and sometimes by his own actions. So let's think about friends. Job's friends fear God's power. They want to wipe out the sense of their selves. They're distressed by God's Job's words. They wish to silence his words, cause him to deny the reality of the situation. Nathan, on the other hand, is a friend who I think loves his friend David and by wisdom is enabling David to see finally the reality of David's situation. So it brings up the question in our next slide here, how do we sit with those like us who may not be worthy? And how do I and others be loved and feel lovable without a transactional relationship with God. I think we struggle with this idea that we need to earn and receive blessings. There is a law irrevocably decreed, and we think it's part of the 550 commandments that we can find in the Old Testament, as opposed to a set of principles that are balancing justice and mercy. So what are some classical responses that we have to build intimacy? We certainly find that as we get to know our friends and ourselves, we run into roadblocks, things that we'd rather not look at, dark shadows, corners that are difficult to wrestle with. So I'm, there may be others. I've jotted down a few here. Uh, story circles are something I've seen emerge in the last, uh, well, certainly in the last four or five years, as in our isolation and our social media firestorms, we're losing the ability to understand someone else's point of view. Buddhism, I've come to appreciate, is a fundamental practice for learning how to see what is really there, being still enough to let the tensions of reality become more apparent to us. Certainly community is a process that brings about intimacy. We find ourselves in a community that we might not have chosen, but in our 
commonplace and other interactions, we come to see a humanity that's larger than how we might have stereotyped someone. Certainly confession, the ability to be honest. I've been interesting for me to see how often 12-step principles have crossed into so many areas of life. My wife and I are have for the last while been asked to host 12-step meetings and looking at both issues as we might typically call addictions, but things like codependency, overeating, uh, any kind of habitual behavior that's founded on where do, what do I do when I am stressed? What do I do when I feel lonesome, lonely or angry? I find some way to, instead of facing it directly, avoid it. One of those interesting principles that I have seen be very successful that is a core principle of those steps is the idea of no crosstalk. We use I statements. So as we look at Job's friends, we don't see a lot of I statements. Job certainly is talking from his personal experience. When we hear the personal experience from others that is courageous, honest, and humble, it empowers us to use those same traits in facing what we need to face. So uh, next slide. Uh, let's see, so who said this? You know, when I first read this, I thought, oh, this is obviously Job speaking. And I realized, no, I'm looking at Psalms today. <laughs> David is asking the same question as Job. Please look at me. A friend of mine recently pointed out in, in the English language, a nice play on the word intimacy is to say, into me see. Am I willing to let someone see me? And so David is saying, Lord, please take an intimate look at my life. Evaluate my inner thoughts and motives, both the good and the bad. Psalms lays out the breadth and depth of what Job, of what David has been experiencing in the same way that we see with Job. And David and Job say, please continue to look at me. I trust that in the honesty of this process, I can find redemption. Okay, so Job and David are both beloved of God. Then they also both are separated from God's presence and shunned by society. Interestingly enough, in a contrast, David is first shunned by society, then embraced by it. Job is first embraced by society and then shunned from it. Like them, we can also feel love, but we also face rejection, despair, fear, loneliness, boredom, anger, uncertainty. So time for those who've been listening patiently. <laughs> I'm just curious to who comes to mind when you ask yourself, oh, Michael, this is, I think, the next slide. Yes, who else has been rejected and despised? Um, it's an opportunity for those to put in their thoughts uh, uh, people that might come to mind. Yeah, certainly, certainly Christ. Uh, I mean, that's what, that's from Isaiah. Um, I had, uh, I kind of tried to chop down a quick list. Uh, I thought of Jeremiah. I thought of Jacob, Nephi, Hagar. Isaac, Israel, Dante, one of my favorites, isolated and exiled from his beloved city of Florence. Cain, also someone beloved of God and rejected. But even in the rejection that Cain experiences when he claims to God his situation is too difficult to bear, God responds with grace and says, to address Cain's concern, I will be killed. God says, no, I am a protector. I will protect thy life. You have made your choice, which has brought great sorrow and evil, but I am still a protector of your life. Laman, Saul, and others. Um, just to name a few, and certainly all of us have probably had that same kind of, uh, same kind of experience. Yes, the one with the issue of blood, the, the woman at the well, um, Samaritan woman, 
So these are common scriptural themes. And one of the things that I hope that people might gain from that reflection on Job this year is recognizing that I think it is too often viewed in the context of our male-centered stories. Others besides males have been rejected. Others besides males have been treated unfairly and struggle with trying to understand why they are in the situation they are in. So in that uh, thought process, I thought, well, let me, about, let me invite my friend John to share his experience and story of Job, as well as for my daughter, Laurel, to share her experience. And with that, I'll transition time over to them. Am I on? You're on, John. Okay. Uh, thanks, oh, Dave. I, John, I forgot, John. Yes. Laurel, I forgot. Laurel has composed a song recently for a production she's supposed to do that uh, I thought was a great example of women meant to represent the anger that women might have felt at the lot that they find themselves on. Laura, you want to give a little introduction? Yeah, I'll give a little, yeah, play. I'd prefer to give the context myself. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, your song, yes. Uh, yeah, no, I'm actually, I'm working on a production right now with a theater company about grief and how our culture does not give space to, or we don't have rituals, we don't have even acknowledgement of grief and how to process it. Um, and as I was working on my little part of this performance, um, uh, this song just kind of came bubbling up um, and it's it's a bit hard to explain but when we go into like the idea of wisdom and the experience of wisdom there is something to the fact of simply all these all these like horrific experiences they're not good we don't want them but there is something to the fact that they open us up to reality um, and there is something uh, sacred about that, even though there is also rage and pain and all that behind it as well. Um, so this is the song and it's still in process. This is kind of like showing a painting that's two thirds done and still has like a lot to win. But um, yeah, did you want to play it or I don't, I don't know how much. Yeah, Michael, Michael's going to go ahead and play yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and play it. Joy said to praise the path, no matter where it led. Well, I praise the blade, I praise the wound, oh, I praise the dead. Sisters, gather round this table, let's make our offerings as we're able. Sisters, gather round this table, call our mothers now. Hail to the frightened child who cannot question why. Hail to the life pole snaking down her thigh. Hail to the trembling virgin caged from knowing more. Hail the rich and bitter knowing of the sacred whore. Mothers gather round this table, I'll make my offerings as I'm able. Mothers gather round this table, hear your daughter now. Hail to the jagged edge that rips me from my dreams. Hail to the monsters that taught me how to scream. Hail to the wild shore that drowns me in its tide. Hail to the innocence that showed me how to die. The secret that they tried to cover is death will come to us as lover and in her fold become our mother to give us new life now. Joy said to praise the path no matter where it led. Well, I praise the blade, I praise the wound, oh, I praise the dead. Yes, oh, I praise the dead. Go ahead, John. Thank you. 
That's kind of hard to follow, <laughs> but I'll do my best. Um, I just want to acknowledge that, um, you know, one of my first experiences of Laurel um, was of her deep compassion. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, so thanks, Dave, for offering me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts about Job. Um, for many years, my reading of Job was uh, primarily reading it as a story about Job and his friends. Job was a righteous man. We know he was righteous because God declared him to be one at the beginning of the story and reaffirmed him to be one at the end of the story. And his friends, on the other hand, judge him to be an unrighteous man based on a distorted understanding of God's plan. They impute sin where there is none in order to justify themselves. Everyone in the book of Job, is, except for Job's wife, is wrong about Job. Job's wife knew Job well enough to know he wasn't to blame for their trials. Her knowledge of Job's goodness impelled her to put the blame for their trials on God. She said, curse God and die. And that was her view of a world in which suffering like theirs could exist. And I want to talk about that a little bit more later. But the important point in the story for me was that apart from Job's wife, every human friend in the story misjudged him and misunderstood him. And it was a reminder to me that even among friends, human judgments of other humans inevitably fall short for reasons related to their own insecurities, imperfections, and hypocrisy. And that was a comforting defense for a young gay man whose friends and family judged him a sinner. They saw my homosexuality and drew all kinds of conclusions about what made me gay. They judged me to be wrong with God somehow, they judged my supposed wrongness with God to be the root cause of my gayness. So having the story of Job be about Job and his friends helped me to keep my sanity and my balance during a difficult time in my life. But as I've grown older and as I've wrestled with the reality of sin in my life and as I have wrestled to come to a deeper understanding of the meaning of life, my understanding of the story of Job has shifted. And for me, that shift has brought me to view the story of Job, Job at its heart as a story about the relationship between Job and God. Job wrestles to make sense of a world that seems to have turned topsy-turvy. He was a good man. He used his wealth and power to benefit those who were less fortunate. His family and his possessions suggested a man blessed by God. And the fact that God could take away everything that he had, could slay his children and servants and other household members who depended on him. And not only that, but afflict him in his very flesh with a disease so painful that Job actually would have considered it a mercy to die. That produced what we might call a crisis of faith for Job. Job's wife presents one very viable option. And I say it's viable because it's an option that we see around us in the world today without having to look very far. Curse God and die. If God is the author of all this mess and confusion, then what do we owe him? It's a question that the world asks every day. We know that Job was a righteous man because the story begins by telling us he was and gives us something of a picture of him as a kind and pious and charitable man. But that was Job's righteousness in the past. Job's righteousness in the present in the narrative is displayed throughout the entire text of the book of Job, and it is in his suspension of judgment about God. He's confused. He's anguished. He repeatedly asks God, how could you do this? By the way, I think it's a stupid defense of God to point out that it wasn't actually God who did it. It was Satan. God merely allowed Satan to do it. It's a legitimate theological point to consider the role of agency, both human and non-human, in the suffering that we see in the world around us. But the fundamental question remains, 
And the reader of Job knows that it remains because God himself set a limit with Satan and said, do anything you want, but don't take his life. If God could set that limit, he could have set any other limit he wanted, including leave that righteous man and his family and his friends alone. So the question remains, why did God do what God did? And Job asks that question again and again throughout the narrative. He asks the question and yet suspends his judgment about the answer. If we're thoughtful believers, we ask that question too every day of our lives. And sometimes the question is more immediate and painful, and sometimes it drifts to the margins of our consciousness, but we wrestle with it nonetheless. It's the nature of human suffering to wrestle with such questions. When we suffer, we not only blame God, we blame ourselves, we blame family and friends, we blame fate. We ask ourselves how this could have been avoided. What could I have done that would have made this different? It's the nature of suffering to want to have avoided it at any cost and to seek to blame when we experience it or witness it. That having been said, the book of Job is not a theodicy. It's not an effort to explain why there is suffering in a world where God is all powerful and all good. The suffering that grabs our attention in the book of Job is not the point of the book of Job. Rather, the point of the book of Job is about God and Job. The first time I read the book of Job, I thought God was going to answer all of Job's questions at the end. And he doesn't. It's really disappointing. God doesn't even bother to present any of the platitudes that we often repeat to explain evil in a world where God is good and all-powerful. God doesn't talk about the importance of agency in his plan. If we want to, we can fill in those blanks. But when we do so, we start to look more like Bill Dead, Eliphaz, and Zophar than like Job. Which brings us back to what I've come to appreciate as the central point of Job. We can't solve the dilemmas of this life. We don't resolve the paradoxes. Life forces us to live with them unresolved. That's the nature of life. And if you've already cursed God and have made your own peace with death, then the solution in the book of Job will be very unsatisfying. Really, there's no solution in the text. The solution is beyond the text. The, the, the text points us to the solution, but it doesn't offer us the solution because the solution reveals itself to us in a God who reveals himself to us. It's in God that we find our peace. And there's nothing about my saying this that can offer comfort to anyone unless, like the text in the book of Job, my statement points you back to that being, unless it drives you to your knees in search for real answers to very real and painful questions from a very real God who hears your prayers and can reveal himself to you. God has revealed himself to me in many times and in many ways, but the time that God revealed himself to me that was most like the experience described in the text in Job uh, occurred in the winter of 2006, in January 2006. It was a moment in which I confronted God in prayer with all of the pain and injustice that I had suffered in my life because of the judgments of others, particularly others in the church. And God spoke to me and said, I forgive you and I love you. And in that moment, I came to terms with my own sin. And I repented of it. 
and I let go of my anger and I forgave everyone and everything that has ever wronged me. And I recognized at a profound level that holding on to my judgments was keeping me from peace. It was keeping me from experiencing the presence of God. And it was keeping me from the peace and the clarity and the beauty of perfect communion with God. Now, words can't capture what that communion is, but I can explain how it works in my life. There's a light that exists beyond the steely gray clouds that breaks through from time to time. And when the light is shining, you know how you should be. You know who you should be. You know how you should walk. You know how to be an expression of that light in the world. And you try to be that because there's nothing more beautiful or more powerful than that light. You want to be part of the breaking of the clouds and the shining of that light. You want to be part of that warmth that reaches others and that awakens them. And when the sun doesn't shine, you still remember what it was like when it did. And you still try to walk in that way and you still try to live your life in a way that that light can break through as often as possible. Because when we remember and when we walk, that's a way of inviting that light to break through. Over the years, I've had a particular experience that I want to share, even though it's very personal and leaves me feeling very vulnerable, but it helps to explain how that light feels in my life. I attend church as often as I can, even though that has been more seldom in the last couple of years with the vicissitudes of COVID. I have occasionally had the experience of a friend or friends attending church with me. I've had this experience numerous times with friends who knew me well and who love me and who understood and knew about my struggles and challenges as a believing gay Latter-day Saint. And I have cherished these friendships because these friends like me have testimonies of the gospel that they cherish. And when they attend church with me, they watch as the sacrament tray is passed down the row and they watch as I pass it on without taking the bread or the water. I don't partake of the physical elements, not because I don't want to, not because the symbolism isn't powerful for me, not because I don't love the Savior or want to take his name upon me or to obey his commandments. I don't partake because I'm excommunicated and I'm not allowed to. And on a few occasions, these friends who've attended church with me have commented on that experience of taking the sacrament and of watching me pass the tray along. And we've talked about it. And sometimes they've experienced some pain and confusion about that experience. And I explain that I cherish the sacrament. I cherish the gospel. I cherish the church. I honor the stewardship of that church. And I honor God through those stewards. And when I'm fully able to partake of the sacrament outwardly as well as inwardly, I want that to be because I've entered in by the gate. I want it to be because there's harmony between things down here below and the perfect reign of God above. Sometimes my friends experience that as a moment of sadness, and sometimes it prompts them to ask the question, why? That same question that plagues the entire book of Job, why, why, why? But for me, those moments experiencing the sacrament and receiving it as we each are able and i receive it in in my heart as i am able it's always an experience of light breaking through those steely gray clouds and it is one of the moments when i feel closest to god and when god's love 
is most palpable to me. And those moments of light I need if I'm going to keep walking in the light. There is a richness in the presence of God. And it is that being in God's presence that is at the heart of Job, to which Job points us, a presence for which the text and the text's unsatisfactorily answered questions can't possibly substitute. And I leave that with you in the name of him who is the light, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Is my sound working well? All right. Thank you, John. Thank you for that. Um, just an FYI, I am in my car because I um, am actually at a nursing home that I have to sing at right when we finish. Um, <laughs> so I drove here to be here <laughs> right when I was done. Um, so, yeah, I actually read, reread Job this morning as I was kind of prepping for this. I have little notes of different stories I can share. And as I, you know, skimmed through it quickly again, the thing that kept coming back, I'm like, wow, the prosperity gospel problem, that's been around for forever since humans started civilizing, you know, like, um, that was the biggest thought that came as I'm reading Job's friends, and I'm like, this is the same argument we make today about, you know, why someone should be where they are, um, and, uh, and what's also fascinating is I was listening to Job's, or I was reading Job's responses, and even though he's in this very bitter, difficult place, like there is so much wisdom in some of the things he's talking about, but it's like the, it's the dark wisdom. It's the dark wisdom that comes from, you know, what would be termed in many cultures, an underworld journey where you have to go traverse through darkness to gain that wisdom. It's not easily bestowed on you. Um, and I know I, you know, the messages from the culture as I grew up and both, you know, church as well as larger American culture um, was this idea that inspiration and spirituality comes as like this warm, beautiful muse all the time. And if it doesn't come that way, it's not God. Um, and uh, I like to compare it to um, a friend of mine who's a writer. She said, you know, a lot of times people think of inspiration as a muse. Um, I think of it as a, it's a Spanish word, duende which is like a little like creature that comes from the ground and basically like wrestles you and it's not like pretty and artsy and la 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 the muses are coming it's like it's from the earth and it's like you will make this art you know um and it's a it's a much more you know um wrestling kind of experience with with you know a spiritual being um and even that song that i wrote has felt very much like that as i'm writing this this isn't one of those like and then beautiful inspiration came it's like whoa there's something coming up from the ground that is like i need to be spoken i need to be seen and as I read through Job, his responses, it was like, what struck me, I was reminded of an experience I had several years before George Floyd happened here in Minneapolis. Um, we'd had several police killings in the years leading up to George Floyd of unarmed black men. And um, the one that hit me the hardest was um, before that, before George Floyd was Philando Castile who was in the car with his fiance and her three-year-old. And when the officers pulled them over, um, they, he told them, I have a, he was trying to do the right thing, saying, I have a gun, I'm going to get it. And the officer shot him. Um, and I was in a show at the time with um, two African-American men. Um, and so it hit me a lot more viscerally than had I just been you know, and mainly a community of white people. I mean, like, oh, that's sad, but, you know, I'm not really affected. And I remember going to church that next Sunday and just there was a sense of devastation that no one was talking about something that was happening in our community, that things felt so detached, like we're in this alternate reality, this, you know, we're in this happy church place. And I was like, but wait, what's happening? This, this happened in our community someone's our, our community is wounded what what are we doing um and i remember the hymn that at the end was um oh savior thou who wearest a crown which is one of my favorites and i just was struck with this sudden spiritual knowing or just this knowing it suddenly hit it, it was as we were singing i was like the way 
that Philando Castile is viewed in your culture by the dominant culture, like, oh, that's too bad, but, you know, we're going to go on. And it's like, that's how Christ was seen by the dominant culture. He was just, you know, that's, that's sad, but, you know, it's a poor minority. And, you know, to the Romans, he would have just been, you know, a poor minority from that upstart, you know, group of Jews. Um, but I hadn't on a visceral level ever really, I could intellectually get that, but it was almost like I finally understood what that felt like um, on a lived level to see my friends have to identify with that and realize how detached I felt from it. Um, and uh, as I was driving, uh, this was uh, probably a year or two before, also before George Floyd, I uh, was listening to like On Being with Krista Tippett and she was interviewing an old activist from the 60s who said there's an old slave song that said, I love everybody, I love everybody, I love everybody, even you that they would sing to the slave drivers or their masters. And she said, this wasn't some like, oh, we're such loving people. She said, this was an act of defiance. We were saying, we are not going to become you, even though what is happening is awful, what is happening is evil. Our act of defiance is that we will never become what you are um, when in that song. And I, as I was listening to that, again, I had this, subtle deep feeling that felt like it came from down below rather than up above uh it said you need to learn the wisdom of these cultures your culture does not have this and if you want to survive what's coming you need to learn this wisdom um this is an embodied wisdom that comes from having to actually experience these things not just theorize about them and um that was that was part of uh, kind of my journey of trying to go, I would say, into a different kind of darkness than I had been taught, not like an evil darkness, but the darkness of wisdom. Um, this also ties into my journey with seeking the feminine, the feminine divine. Um, and uh, I have several notes of where that happened, but it ties in because as I started doing more research, uh, both historically of like what happened to like with monotheism and like where where our culture started to um, started to cut off the feminine, um, you know, because Judaism was actually used to be monotheistic as I did more research or it didn't used to be polytheistic. <laughs> it used to it, it, it moved from polytheism to monotheism. Um, and uh, and a lot of that, you know, couples in with patriarchy and eliminating you know, feminine deities so that you can have a supreme male deity. And, you know, all that's intellectually interesting, but it was when I got pregnant for the first time, I felt something in my body that said, I need my mother and not just my physical earthly mother. I need, I need my mother. There is something happening inside my body. I feel the spirit in my body. I don't understand what's happening, but there has to be some wisdom about this. And I ended up getting really frustrated that within my own religion, we have pages and pages on how exactly to organize the priesthood and how exactly like all this, you know, power needs to be organized and nothing about pregnancy, which is like the entire, like none of this happens. None of this happens without pregnancy, without birth. Like none of this exists. All of these things were getting so, it's, it's like, to me, it was like ignoring the root of a tree to get on like one little tiny branch and like analyze that little branch or leaf and be like, yeah, we need to analyze this one leaf. It's like, okay, but what about the trunk of this tree? Like, what, what do we know about that? Um, and uh, so I, for me, that was happening around the same time of all this seeking uh, around understanding racial issues as well um, on a more honest level, a more deeply honest level, um, not just a way so I could be like, well, I'm a good person because I did my research and <laughs> now I can say I'm not racist. Um, and uh, one, one of the experiences I had, again, this is tying back to the different kinds of spirituality I started to experience um, as opposed there. I still have moments of comfort and all that, which I still deeply treasure, but it's kind of the Job thing where it's like, you want to meet reality. You want to meet God. Okay. <laughs> like that is a bodily experience. That is not a theoretical one. That is something to be experienced in your body. And um, when I, one night I read, um, 
uh, uh, Mother's Milk by Rachel. Um, oh my gosh, I'm going to say her last, I can't remember her last name at the moment, but um, this is when I was seeking to know my mother. Um, and I just, I sobbed reading that book. It was like reading scripture. It was that sense of, oh my gosh, where is, I feel like connected to this divine mother again. And I was just sobbing that night. I was praying. I'm like, please let me know you. Let me know you better. And I went to bed and I'm expecting this like wonderful, loving, you know, hoping for this like wonderful, loving experience. And um, just, this is a trigger warning, just FYI. This was a dream I had. Um, that was like not expected by me at all. This was this was the the answer I was given. Um, so it is a bit disturbing, but I had a dream that night um, of women lying down in a tent. They were all lying on mats. It was like age eight to age eighty. Like it was like it was almost like this this whole village or town. All the women were just lying on a mat inside a tent waiting. And then it was like I saw outside the tent and. There were all these soldiers. They looked like they were dressed in like either Greek or Roman garb. They were just casually talking outside the tent. And in the dream, I knew they were just, they were waiting to go inside and rape every woman that was inside the tent. Um, and it wasn't anything aggressive. It wasn't anything they weren't looking forward to it or hating it. It was just, that's just what you do. That's just what you do when you win a war. That's just, you know, that next item on the checklist. And I remember waking up and going, what was that? I, I didn't, and, and it was, I felt like there was this question. It's like, do you want to know me? This is what I go through. This is what it is to know the mother. Um, this is what has been hidden for a long time. I mean, it's not really hidden, but we don't want to face it. Same thing with a lot of the things I was trying to start to face. And yet, if you can go to those depths, there is a different kind of love that is so grounded. And um, I will share the most, there was one just beautiful experience I had in my searchings for the Divine Feminine. Um, when I, I'd been praying a lot, I think this was maybe before my dream or soon after it. Um, we had an experience where I got in a car accident, or I didn't get one. Someone actually ran right into me in the parking lot, and they obviously couldn't pay for the damages, and I was trying to figure out what to do. I'm like, oh, like, what should I do? Should we charge them? And I had just this thought come into my head that says, well, you could be merciful. And so I said, okay, why don't you just, I gave them a few options and I said, or, you know, like practical ones. So my practical brain could be like, this is what we should do, <laughs> you know? Um, but then I said, or um, why don't you just pay us 10% of the damage up front and we'll call it good. Um, and, and they went with that. And I was driving home after I'd kind of sent them this email, after I'd sent this email about it. And, you know, was, I don't know if other people have like huge spiritual experiences in the car. Um, but I, I was driving home and I just suddenly had this feeling of this over, it was very feminine. It was this overwhelming, like, like encasing, like expansive feeling of grace and love. And my spiritual experiences, I don't, I never hear words, but I have to give them words. So the words I would say is the feeling was because you showed a tiny drop of mercy, just the teeniest drop of mercy. I'll show you the, the sea that that mercy comes from. And it was like, I could feel an ocean underneath me that I, it was this feeling like, oh my gosh, this has been here the whole time. This has been here the whole time. And it was, and it was also this feeling that it was so, so deep that it looked dark, that it looked black and it looked terrifying. <laughs> if you've ever seen like really deep water, it's beautiful and terrifying um, because it's so deep and it will swallow you. Um, and the feeling was, this is my mercy. You can't even comprehend it. It is so deep. It will look terrifying to you. And it is in all things. It is the water in all things. It is me. I am literally in all of you. There is nothing that can escape me. 
And that is my mercy that I am with you all the time in all things. Um, so um, since then, I, uh, what were the difficulty of that was that it was hard to have these experiences and then try and make them make sense in church. <laughs> um, with, and uh, I, I remember tr just being really torn over what should I do. Um, and a, uh, this, this year, I, I just had suddenly this feeling of, at a particular time in the year, it was like, if you, if this is the path you want to go down, you need to leave the church because of the direct, of where you were wanting to go. And it wasn't like an angry thing, like the church is so bad or anything like that. It was just, if this is the path you want to go, then you can't stay here. Um, and I was given lots of, you know, very personal small signs that are like, I've got you, I've got you. Um, and I ended up having, um, a remarkably beautiful experience with my bishop telling him I wanted to leave the church. There was no manipulation. There was no shame. There was just respect and a very sincere sad, we will miss you. Um, but it was actually one of the most beautiful and respectful experiences I had. And that also healed a lot of the feminine wound of not feeling taken seriously of I am taken seriously and I am respected for this path. So, um, he was a great blessing in that. Um, and ironically, right when that happened, it was like a few days later, I found out that <laughs> at General Conference, they had the, the talk about we shouldn't pray to Heavenly Mother. <laughs> and so I said, well, I, yeah, for my path, this is where I need to be. Um, and it is a lot of, it's not super certain. It, it, for me, it is finding that reality in the body, finding going into the dark places and knowing there is still love there um, and and finding ways to um, to bring that back in harmony because you've been so afraid of the wisdom of darkness for so long um, but it is I think it is the thing that will heal us um, and uh, and and to be frank I'm, it's it was a lot of the example when I really started studying Christ and studying the way he lived and who he would have been in this culture that started to lead me there and saying, I need to look at the places, the dark places no one wants to look at because I have to believe in a God that exists there, not just a God that exists in the pretty places. So um, thank you for having this. Um, I leave this with you in the name of Jesus Christ and in the name of the mother. Well, thank you, Laurel. <clears throat> Such a yin and yang to hear John and Laurel talk about their encounter with the divine and where it's led them. <laughs> and sorry, I'll need to compose myself a little bit here too. Um, um, so I'll conclude just a few remarks. Um, uh, <clears throat> First of all, I, uh, uh, let's see. So rest restoration, John and Laura are on paths of restoration. Restoration is not to go back to Eden. <clears throat> restoration is to build a new city that hasn't been here before. It's a path that says, I'm willing to keep discovering something. You know, in 12 steps, they talk about, I'm a recovering person. I've realized I'm a discovering codependent. I discover every day new ways in which I rejoice in my dependency on others. And I rejoice in recognizing I took for granted boundaries that were not mine to cross. And it's not something I can say, well, the last time I crossed a boundary or the last time I, uh, <clears throat> took someone for granted was 12 years and five days ago. <laughs> it's five minutes or whatever it may have been. But it is a focus on balance and harmony, which I hope is a, has been a powerful lesson for me to remember. Psalms is about music and blending and seeking for that which is lost. What would it be like to hear the music of Psalms restored? 
it's not just I lie down in green pastures. It's I remember, as John said, the light that beams forth so that when I am in the pit of despair, I know that both of these are real and I can learn wisdom in both of those. For me, I'm one of those people that sat with John at sacrament meeting. And it's a reminder to me of someone who can take the sacrament that there is work to be done until John and I can partake of that and every other son and daughter of God. I am not to lie down in green pastures. I am to be willing to be discomfited and wrestle with difficult things. Um, I hope for those of you who have the opportunity, thank you so much, Laurel. Yes, go sing beautiful stuff. <laughs> for those of you who have the opportunity to read through Job, I was struck by the images of God that are so much a yin and yang. There is power and nurturing. There is fearsomeness and tenderness that he continues to vacillate back and forth to that. And I look at what happened to Job after he had the experience with the divine. I thought there were two remarkable things. One is that he forgives his friends who have created such pain in the same way that John has talked about. That is not an easy thing to do. And it's only after Job forgives his friends that God actually restores his blessings. The other interesting thing is that Job names his three daughters and says they have an inheritance. So as I thought about it, if this was in the time of the patriarchs, this is a time where God is giving people inheritances. And he gives Abraham an inheritance. So what would he give Job as an inheritance? And I think Job says, I have three daughters. I saw in the whirlwind what Laurel saw. I realized that my male-centric world has been ignoring the feminine and the divine. And I want to give my daughters an inheritance. Perhaps the inheritance of the feminine wisdom that we see continuing to percolate throughout the Old Testament. Again, speculation, but a possibly empathetic reading to what is implied but not seen in the book of Job. So all of us have more encounters of the divine ahead. To conclude, um, Michael, I think given where our time is at, I'd like to conclude with, uh, oh, I need to make okay, that's right. one last thing to do. Do you have the wild ox there um, on the slides? If you want to bring up the, this is one of the questions that Job has asked. Is the wild ox willing to be your servant? Next slide. Can you pull in Leviathan with a hook? Will it make numerous supplications to you? Will it speak to you with tender words? Can you play with it like a bird or tie it on a leash for your girls? So what a contrast. Here's this image of Leviathan that I think of. And God is saying, the kind of person that I am, I contain this. So a concluding question for people to consider on their own. The next slide is, what are the Leviathans of our day? Each of us may be facing them in similar ways. Uh, you're welcome to include some that you may find uh, that may come to you, but certainly social strife, war in Ukraine, uh, conflict, the difference of institutions, powerlessness and alienation that people may feel. These are all Leviathans of our day. Um, and but with that is the invitation that I think Job may have received and said, you can now enter into my world. These are the things I wrestle with. Come and be like me. Learn to patiently wrestle with the difficult issues that you may find the depth of peace and joy that John and Laurel have so eloquently and honestly shared. So with that, my final invitation 
would be for our closing song. Um, the last thing, the only things I hate in a sacrament meeting is you've had beautiful music and then someone has to get up and comment about it. <laughs> so, oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks, Michael. One last image there. The other surprise that I think Job discovers, not only does he see the, the heavens and the stars shout for joy, but he sees death. He sees his redeemer. What would he see his redeemer? I had the I had the experience recently of of dreaming as well <laughs> about the pain and anguish of the world and how there's so little we can control about the ones that we love. And hearing a faint whisper behind me of Christ saying, there's something so precious in that experience that I gave up everything so that we too could become like Job. Um, so uh, with that, I have a set of slides. Let's see, I forgot, Michael, how are we gonna do this here? Um, oh, why don't, uh, yeah, we'll do the, let's do the music and then have Cindy do the closing prayer. Um, and so remind me, Michael, how we're gonna do this here. To open our hearts and our minds that we might be able to know thee better and and thereby learn to love without qualification our other others and ourselves we pray that we may keep um, an open heart and an open mind and realize that thou can speak to us in so many ways and we pray that we may be open to that and hear of thy love for us and our brothers and sisters. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, this is open time.